The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? I'd like you to do a thought experiment with me. Imagine for a second that you're about to meet a person for the first time and the only thing you know about that person is that they're a woman. What words come to mind? In your head, think about a few adjectives that you might use to describe that person. Now, imagine that you're about to meet a person for the first time, and the only thing you know in advance about that person is that they're a man. What words come to mind now? What are some adjectives that you might use to describe that person? Finally, imagine that you're about to meet a person for the first time, and the only thing you know about that person is that they're a leader. What words come to mind? If you're anything like most people, you'd create three lists for these three individuals, and you'd have quite a bit of overlap on your lists that compare man and leader, and you'd have a lot less overlap on your lists for woman and leader. This was the finding of a study that was first done in 1973, and it's been replicated over and over in a number of different audiences in the 40-some years since. Basically, when we think about manager or business professional or leader, we think about characteristics that are really similar to our conceptualization of male. If you look at the Faith at Work movement over the past 10 or 20 years, you see a predominantly male movement. You can see it here at the Faith at Work Summit, where we've got about four men for every one woman. I want to talk about why this happens, what the Faith at Work movement should do about it, and why we should care. I'm going to start with the why we should care piece, and I want to talk specifically about why we should care about gender within our own ranks, and also about why we should care um, as we minister to people in the workplace. There are two answers here to the why we should care question. The first is theological, and the second is pragmatic. From a theological perspective, the first chapter of Genesis gives us a really helpful framing. In Genesis 1, 27 to 31, we read, So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Now, I take three big ideas away from this passage. First, God models work for us in creation. In making the earth and ultimately making humankind, scripture shows that God is a worker. Second, men and women together are image bearers of God. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And thirdly, men and women are called to work. Not only are we made in God's image, and God is a worker, but also in the creation mandate, humans are instructed to increase, fill, subdue, and rule all different types of work tasks. So together, men and women reflect the image of God, and together, men and women are called to work. If this is what God ordained in creation, we need to be sure that our workplaces reflect the value and input of both men and women. And as it turns out, when organizations operate this way, they work pretty well. Companies with at least three women in executive management are rated more positively by their employees on a large number of factors, things including innovation, work environment, accountability, motivation. Companies with at least one woman on their board of directors outperform those with no women by about 25%. Companies with more than one woman on their boards do even better, 
with one study showing performance outcomes of 40 to 60% better compared to companies with no women on their boards. From a pragmatic perspective, there are also reasons that the faith at work movement needs to care about gender. Frankly, there are a lot of women, both in our churches and in the workplace. Among 18 to 29-year-old church attendees, 57% are women. Interestingly, this is uh, very close to the same ratio that we see in higher education. This year, among business majors, for every two men graduating with a business degree, three women will do the same. The Faith at Work movement needs to be far more intentional about including women in order for it to flourish. Male and female, God created them together. God blessed them together. God called them to work together. So we need to care about the opportunities available to women in the workplace and within, the faith at, and within faith at work organizations. But opportunities for men and women are very different. Um, they're not equal. What challenges are specific to women in the workplace? First, all of us, men and women alike, have what we call implicit biases about the performance and roles of men and women. We can see this with a number of studies that use a methodology called the Goldberg paradigm. Using this method, researchers will give a speech or a paper to subjects and ask them to evaluate it. And when the subjects think that a man wrote it, they tend to give it a higher evaluation than if they think a woman wrote it. This phenomenon isn't limited to speeches and papers either. It's been replicated with resumes. When someone gets a resume with a woman's name, they're less likely to call her for an interview than if they get the exact same resume with a man's name. Research grants have been found to be equally problematic. Granting agencies are more likely to provide grants to male researchers. It's estimated that a woman needs to be about two and a half times as productive as a male colleague to get an equivalent amount of grant money. There's a test called the Implicit Association Test that allows us to measure these implicit biases directly. This is a computer-based test where people have to pair words and images together. It turns out when we can um, have, a, have a connection or have an implicit idea that connects these idea, the, the words in the pictures, we can do this very quickly. When we don't have that intuitive connection between the words and the pictures, it takes us a lot longer. Interestingly, most people pair male faces quite quickly with words like executive and president. And they pair female faces quite quickly with words like assistant and aid. It takes a lot longer to do the opposite pairings. The thought experiment that you did just a few minutes ago demonstrates another expectation that many of us hold. We expect men to be assertive and task-oriented. We expect women to be nurturing and relational. Now, let me be really clear here. These are not just expectations that men have about women. These are expectations that both men and women have about each other. And both men and women tend to have fairly negative perceptions of women who don't meet gender stereotypes of being nurturing and relational. Here's the trouble. We tend to think about leadership traits as including things like being direct and task-focused and assertive and so on. And when men express these traits, that's consistent with our expectations for them. But when women act in the exact same ways, it runs counter to our expectations, and we typically have a pretty negative reaction. We make negative attributions about the woman in question. So a woman ends up in a situation that's called a double bind. If she acts in ways that are consistent with her gender stereotype, nurturing, relational, kind, and so on, we look at her and we like her, but we don't typically think of her as a leader. On the other hand, if she acts in ways that are consistent with our conceptions of leadership, direct, task-focused, assertive, and so on, we might think of her as a leader, but we don't really like her. Men simply don't have to make the same trade-off. And perhaps because of this double bind, men and women don't move up in organizations in the same way. A study that came out this year from McKinsey found that although men and women start in organizations at the entry level, about equally represented, by the time you get to the C-suite, fewer than one in five executives is a woman. At every level of the upward pipeline, women get filtered out. We know that on their performance appraisals, women on average get lower performance evaluations than men do. 
And interestingly, this is true even when the objective performance is exactly the same. And finally, women get paid less than men. Now, you've probably heard a range of numbers here about how much women make relative to men. And these numbers can be somewhat misleading because it's not always comparing apples to apples. Men and women don't always go into the same industry or take the same jobs. Um, they may take different time out to care for families and so on. However, when you, can, uh, when you equalize everything you can think of to equalize in order to compare men and women, if you look at men and women within the same industry, within the same job, uh, men and women who've had the same number of hours worked, same tenure with an organization, same ambitions, um, same performance, and so on, women still get paid 5 to 10% less than men for the exact same work. So we know that men and women have different experiences at work. And we know that for practical and theological reasons, we should care about the opportunities of women at work. Male and female, God created them together. God blessed them together. God called them to work together. So what can we do to make God's purposes a reality? There are things that you can do at an individual level. Women often have a hard time being assertive or taking credit for their accomplishments. If you're a woman, you especially need to do this, while at the same time being relational, expressing warmth to others, soliciting participation from others. If you're a man, look for ways to acknowledge the performance and accomplishments of women. For men and women, it's important to expand your network in the workplace. Connect with people of the opposite gender, from whom you can learn and to whom you can contribute. We know that men are more likely than women to have mentors in organizations. Everyone should have somebody that they look up to as a mentor. If you don't have one, look for one. If you're in a leadership position, look for others whom you might be able to mentor. And especially look for women, because they're less likely to have the connections to those in positions of power. If you're in a decision-making role in an organization or in a business, there are a lot of things you can do to make your workplace more fair. One of the most important things that you can do is to acknowledge your own subtle and unconscious biases. Remember, all of us, men and women, have biases. It's not because you're mean or you're trying to be discriminatory. When we become aware of the ways in which our biases can impact our decision-making, we start to become aware of the ways to combat them. If you're in a position of power, you can intentionally recruit women into leadership roles. Look for ways that women are contributing in your organization and reward this. And don't stop with just one woman. Remember, the research shows that organizations with more women at the top have performance advantages. If you're a pastor or in a leadership role in a ministry organization, there are things you can do too. Make sure that when you're using examples of people expressing their faith at work, Provide examples of women. If you offer classes or small groups that are focused on business or vocation, make sure that these are available to everyone. About 10 years ago, I was at a Christian business breakfast, and the speaker was in town talking about an organization he was part of that was creating small groups of business professionals where they could meet together, engage with each other, support, and encourage each other. And as I was listening, I was thinking, wow, this would be a great group to be a part of. But when I talked to the speaker after the breakfast, I found out that they only had groups for men. Now, many churches do offer groups for women. Oftentimes, these groups are focused on family issues. Oftentimes, these groups meet during work hours. Um, many, if not most, female parishioners work. They may not be able to meet during the day. They may be really interested in meeting with other women who are engaging with professional challenges. When you're introducing new members to the church body, be sure to share with the congregation the specific giftings, the specific occupations of each person. Match these gifts to needs within the, or within the church, regardless of gender. Some men may be really good in children's ministry or in hospitality. Some women's gifts may be particularly suited to finance or to adult Sunday school programs. Return with me for a minute to the thought experiment that you did at the beginning. This time, I'd like you to picture a young woman who's close to you. This might be a friend or a colleague. It might be a daughter or a niece. In your mind, picture her being interviewed for a job. What are the words you hope come to mind when the interviewer evaluates her skills and talents? How do you want her capabilities to be assessed? 
It's clear that women particularly face unique challenges at work. All of us who have an interest in faith at work have a responsibility to both understand and address these challenges together. Male and female, God created them together. God blessed them together. God called them to work together. Male and female, God wants us to flourish together. <laughs>